Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I've been on this journey for a while, and, and uh, some of you may have uh, had this experience before where you can be in a million sermons and you can hear things over and over again, but then sometimes someone will tell a story or they'll say something, and the Lord will red letter what they say in your heart. You know what I'm saying? You think, oh, and you write it down in your journal, and that's good, and then you go home and you explore it, and it expands, and it's awesome. And uh, another experience that I had is that sometimes God will say something in the natural. You might ask him a question, he'll answer in the natural, but when he gives you the natural answer, it has this reverberating spiritual implication to it, and I'll share the story with you. So I, I, I heard a meeting, and uh, the guy was uh, teaching on faith, and I, I think he was a pastor. This was a while ago, so I, I might be sort of trying to piece this together. But uh, before he was in ministry, he was a painter, but he was a Christian painter, so he did everything with integrity. And uh, he got this contract, went into a, a very nice home, uh, but the home had some issues and stuff because it was an older home. And he patched and primered everything in this room, and then he painted it, and he did the very best he could as under the Lord, and it was beautiful. And the woman came out and said, oh, my God, you know, I'm going to recommend you to all my friends. You do such a wonderful job. And he said, well, thank you very much. Glory to God. So she paid him. He left. And two days later, he gets a call. And the woman says, well, you did something wrong here because you need to come back. And he's like, well, what do you mean? It looked beautiful when I left. She said, no, no, you need to come. So he, wanting to be integrous in his business, he drives out there. He goes and he looks at the wall and there are all these major cracks in the wall. And he's like, that's really weird. You know, I patched all these cracks, right? So he says, no worry, I, I guarantee my work. So he repatches everything and he reprimes and repaints and he steps back and he says, it, it, I did my best, it's good. She says, yes, it looks fine. Thank you so much for coming back out and doing it again. Two days later, he gets another call. He runs out there and all those cracks had reappeared and she's starting like to accuse him of not being good at what he does. So he's a little bit confused and he's like praying and saying, Lord, what's going on? I did my very best. I, I, if I do it again, I'm going to start losing money here. And the Lord speaks to him and said, she doesn't have a wall problem. She has a foundation problem. So basically what he was saying is that the foundation was unsure. It was shifting and the wall was fine. But when you, when you patch and paint the wall, if the foundation that's holding up the wall shifts, the wall cracks, right? And so we want to look at that in light of the scriptures. Uh, if you could put up the Romans 1, 16 and 17 for me, I'm going to read that. I have, sorry, old King James, but I think they're going to put new King James up for you in case you're writing it down. Um, verse 16, for Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth or believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes just breaking that down so that there is no misunderstanding on any aspect of that verse because your salvation is based on it, okay? First of all, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Uh, it's the power of God. And uh, it talks about uh, unto salvation. So I don't know about you, but I like getting down to what it really means. And I, I'm kind of addicted to the concordance because the concordance, in my way of thinking, once you've gone that deep, it's beyond debate. It is for me anyway. I, I act and live off what I see if it's written in Greek or Aramaic or Hebrew. So the word gospel is euangelion. I may have mispronounced it, but that's as much Greek as I can get. The word you, E-U, means good. And most of us know this, but I just want to kind of go over it. Angelion uh, translates uh, messenger. It's where we, an angel is a messenger of the Lord. Uh, Angelion has a, 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 
a different connotation, which I'm going to talk about in a second. It translates to be a bearer of good news or glad tidings. What I didn't know in reading the concordance is that it's a military term. And it usually denotes one who brings good news from the battlefield to the king to say the victory has been won. Now imagine we're all called to preach the gospel at some level. And it's great to go to people and say, you know, Jesus died for our sins. And yeah, you're an ugly sinner, but you know, you might get to heaven if you believe in Jesus. <laughs> That's not completely untrue. Okay. But imagine the spirit of a man who just was part of a battle that they won and they conquered a kingdom and he sent back to run as fast as he can to the king to say, we won. We won the battle. That's the gospel. That's the military term saying we won the battle. When Jesus told us to go and preach the gospel, he's telling us to tell the world there was a battle between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And when I came up out of the grave, we won. Amen. And the implications of the winning of that war don't just affect Christians. It affects the whole world. But it can't affect them if they don't know. Some of them don't even know they're in a battle or that there was a battle. And so our job is to tell them there was a battle and we won. And you can enter into this victory if you want. That makes the gospel good news, right? You know, you don't even have to fight. You don't even have to enlist. The battle's already won. You just step in line for the trophies, right? That's kind of exciting. I also came to find out, and I think Pastor Virginia was there. We were at a conference, and somebody defined the word apostle. And the word apostle is also a military term. These were borrowed terms from the Romans that were used in, in, in the day because it was a Roman culture surrounding a Jewish culture. And the word apostle is a military term denoting a person or persons sent by a king to establish a new culture in the conquered land. So if, if, if the Romans went and conquered Britain, but they allowed it to remain Britain, there would always be revolts and there would always be uprisings and that sort of thing. So after Britain was conquered by the Romans, they sent educators, they sent artisans, they sent all kinds of people from Rome to redefine the culture and make it look like Rome, right? So the job of an apostle is to come into a territory and reform the territory that's been conquered to look like the territory that he represents. This is why Jesus said, I've won the victory. Now you believers occupy, transform the culture until I come. Make the earth culture look like the kingdom culture, right? Now, the word culture gets thrown around a lot and people have... We have our own identities and cultures, but God is talking about the kingdom culture. Jesus prayed, Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy culture be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's the job and, uh, of, of a reformer, of an apostle, and the people that are moving in that direction with that apostolic mandate. Does that make sense? Okay. They're sent to establish a new culture, a reformation of thought leading to a reformation of actions. Now, here's an interesting thing that I found in the word. Remember when Jesus told Peter, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Remember that? And yet we today, we misidentify what Jesus is saying. And we say, oh, he gave his life to Jesus last night. He's a new convert. Well, Jesus, I mean, Peter walked with Jesus for three years, and in the, in the mind of Christ, he wasn't even converted yet, right? So obviously, it's not just praying the sinner's prayer that makes you converted. Conversion happens when you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then glorification comes, and now you are a rocket that cannot be stopped, 
And he said to Peter, when that happens to you, strengthen your brethren. They're going to need you because you're going through process. But when you're out the other side of process, you're going to be raising up people who are in process. You need to tell them, hold on. Right? Because process can sometimes be uncomfortable. So, the word conversion, I looked it up. It blew me out. It, it means a complete and thorough revolution against an established system of thought. That means we get saved in a world, and this world, I don't know, I mean, if, you, if you go on Facebook or you follow politics and everything, you... you I mean, I used, when I was a young man, I was proud to be an American. And, you know, my dad was in the military. And, and I would look at America, and I would, you know, you'd see the flag waving on TV and weep a little bit and everything. <laughs> now, I, I, I don't even feel like I know even anybody in this nation what's going on. I can't. I'm looking for something to be proud of sometimes, and I have to struggle to find something. It's very, very sad. But... The enemy is fighting for occupation. He is holding on to what he lost, trying to convince it that he convince us that he hasn't lost it. And he's trying to influence the direction of the culture to go evil, more evil every day. And the church is letting him. And we need to rise up and reform. You know, I, I'm one of the well, I'll save that and go down a different direction. So we've defined gospel, right? Uh, the gospel is the power. A lot of us are familiar with the word. It's dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite in English. It means explosive, miraculous working power or ability. It means the might to accomplish or establish the apostolic mandate. That means that He's calling us to carry an apostolic mandate, but we're not going to affect and influence culture without Holy Ghost power. Because if we don't have Holy Ghost power that confirms the word with signs following, then they're just two opinions arguing with each other. But if we raise somebody from the dead after we tell them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, there's not much more opinions that can, can uproot that kind of demonstration, right? Yeah. So we need to be moving towards believing God for that kind of manifestation of power. Am I right? Everybody with me? Yes. Okay. Now, we're all at different stages. We're all uh, growing in God. Uh, we're partnering with churches that may not be there yet, and that's all good. We're all the body. I'm not diminishing or separating or segregating, calling people unspiritual or spiritual, but I know that God is moving every believer forward into a broader landscape of believing for this end time harvest that's coming, right? Okay. And sometimes we differ in, in how vast that landscape looks. So we don't want to judge each other, you know, on where we are. We just want to help each other move forward. But we also don't want to shove our opinion down somebody else's throat because we may believe this and you, you may not, right? Give people the, the Bible says that he, talking about the Lord, who began a good work and you will complete it. Not, uh, not us, right? He completes it, right? So we're all at different levels moving forward, and God is at the helm. And let God be God, right? Now, you do pray for people, right? Try to lift them up in the spirit and let God move. So the explosive, miraculous working power uh, gives us dynamic influence. The word salvation, soteria, and, and this, this is sometimes amazes me, but when people talk about salvation, there is a large segment of the body of Christ that simply believes that if, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you know, you're going to live like the devil, but at least you're going to go to heaven. And that is not what soteria means at all. Soteria means deliverance for the whole man, spirit, soul, body, welfare, and finances. That is what Jesus died to give us. And we only signed up for a portion of the package because somebody told us that's the only portion there was. I want to, you know, Pastor Meeks talking about stretching, and one of those areas that we stretch is we stretch uh, our mind to believe that God is this good. 
You know, because we want to put God in the box. Well, you know, I don't know if I believe that. Why not? All things are possible to them that believe, right? So Tyria means deliverance for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body, welfare, prosperity in the here and now, not in the by and by. I won't need much money when I get to heaven. <laughs> I know that prosperity preachers get a bad rap, and, and, and yes, the love of money is the root of all evil, and some people who preach prosperity have fallen victim to a little bit too much of love for that money, if you know what I'm saying. But money's a tool. Without it, we can't preach the gospel. Without it, we can't go and take food to Oaxaca, right? We, you cannot do what God has called you to do without finances. Uh, a wise man once said, provision from God is always guaranteed at the point of your assignment. Now, we believe God for all of that extracurricular stuff, and he's not opposed if, it's not, if it doesn't have a hold of us and we're praying for it, that's different, right? But the point is provision for your assignment, right? You know, it's like, you know, I just wrote, let's say I just wrote a book, hypothetically speaking, I'm working on one, but let's say I wrote one, but I, I can't, I don't have any money to publish it. I don't have any money to create it. I don't have anybody to edit it. Um, I don't even know anybody that might want to do a forward. <laughs> God opens all those doors because he gave you the assignment, Right? So if he told you to do it, he's going to grease the shoot and make it happen. But make sure he told you to do it. Because there's a lot of believers that are struggling to do stuff God never asked them to do. Right? You know, I love that Pastor Mauricio said, I was in Oaxaca just buying coffee. And God said, build me a school. Okay? You can't steal that from his heart. Right? If anybody's ever had a, an assignment encounter like that, I mean, they'll beat you up and jump you. And it's like, no, God told me. Right? But what if, and he didn't, but what if all of a sudden, well, man, we're having a huge impact on Oaxaca. Let's do Mexico City, too. Well, if God didn't say do Mexico City, you remember when Paul is going to Asia? Because the word said go into the, all the world and preach the gospel. And he's going to Asia, and the Lord said don't go to Asia. Okay. We start out going into all the world. We start out doing whatever it is our hands fight to do. But at some point, you hone in with your relationship with God to your specific assignment because that's where the anointing is going to be, right? And that's where the protection and the safety is going to be. It broke me. You know, I went, what I believe by divine appointment, on a missions trip to the Philippines. And there were dangerous circumstances there. But we had favor. We had military. We had all kinds of stuff. But at the same time that I was there, uh, another couple from Kansas went to the Philippines, and they were murdered, and they were missionaries. And that kind of made me nervous, you know. Um, but some people, they launch out into assignments that God didn't tell them to go to. So it's very important that we cultivate intimacy with the Lord so we know exactly what he's calling us to do. Now, the verse goes on. Let me read verse 17. For therein... In what? In the gospel, in the good news. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now, you can read that and go, oh, yeah, God's righteous. He's awesome, man. I mean, don't, get, don't, don't let your sinful flesh get close to his righteousness, man. You, your head will explode. Right? That's not what it's saying. But people want to make it say that. What it's saying is the way of righteousness is revealed. Right? So if I preach the gospel and I tell you that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins... And he took his blood and he put it on the mercy seat. And now every time that you come to the throne room of God and your knees are shaking together like I don't deserve to be here, you must understand that, number one, you're not there alone. You're there with Jesus, your advocate. And also the father, when he looks at you, is looking through the wings of the cherubim across the ark at the blood of Jesus. And he never sees you from any other angle. There's never a time when you position yourself in front of the Father that he doesn't see you through red. And because he sees you through red, you have access with boldness to obtain grace and mercy in your time of need. So the righteousness which is by faith is our salvation. Now here's the important thing. When we exercise our faith, Oh, I'm believing for, you know, a ministry. Oh, I'm believing for a building. I'm believing for a salvation of my family. I'm believing. And you find a promise. 
No, Lord, you said in Philippians 4.19, you know, my bills are stacked this high, but you said in Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I'm standing on that promise right there. What happens? The accuser of the brethren, the devil, immediately goes after your faith by trying to disqualify you by saying, yeah, after what you did yesterday, I don't think it's going to happen. Those are the cracks in the wall of your faith right there, right? Now, what is it that's going to cause you to go, it's going to happen because you are not basing your relationship with God on your performance. You're rebasing your relationship with God on the performance of Jesus Christ, which was perfect, and the sin penalty credit that he gave you, and he ratified it in his own blood, and therefore, we look the accuser of the brethren in the face and said, everything that you said about me is true. And some things you didn't even see. But Jesus paid for them. If we don't have a firm foundation of the righteousness which is by faith laid, and I'm not talking about an intellectual ascent. I'm talking about I know that 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 I'm the righteousness of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And to say or believe anything less cheapens what Jesus did on my behalf. And I will not insult him by, by cheapening his blood by saying it's not enough to cover all my junk. Amen. And so because we believe that now I have a foundation, now I find my promise and I begin to build on that foundation. Jesus said to Peter, whom do men say that I am? And he threw out a bunch of stuff. And he said, who do you say that I am? It doesn't matter what people believe about Jesus. It matters what you believe about Jesus. If you believe that you're the righteousness of God by faith, you have built your faith upon the rock that cannot move. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard of righteousness against him. OK, because that is, and, and, a, and a, a standard is a rallying point for an army. That means when you say, I bind you, Satan, I'm the righteousness of God. You can't touch me. You just declared his righteousness. Now you've exalted the standard of righteousness and angels who are part of God's army are predisposed to rally around and protect that declaration. Right. And so. Everything we built, actually, when Jesus, it says that Jesus has dealt to every man the measure of faith, right? Well, what does the measure produce for us? Faith for righteousness. That's what salvation is, faith for righteousness, right? But now that we recognize that we're righteous, we go from faith to faith. You know, we step out on that thin ice of righteousness and we believe for something and God comes through and oh, it worked, it worked, right? Now we take that same mindset and we go out a little bit farther on that limb. You know, it's still working. Oh, my God. And we're out there because we've built and established believing God for the promises on the sure foundation of right standing with God. Do you know, in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, I mean, God comes like, hey, Adam, it's our time, man. Let's hang out under this tree and talk about your day. I mean, the Bible said that God came looking for Adam. Do we, do we not all know that God knew that he sinned? Okay. But here's what's funny. We think that sin somehow has a, a gag reflex repulsive effect on God. And that his holiness, if he gets ne next to your stuff, he's like, uh -huh. oh. okay, go get your act together and call me later. No, God knew Adam sinned, and God went looking for Adam. He wanted to fix it. He wanted to repair it. So what was the problem? Adam knew he was naked. The glory that came upon Adam from fellowshipping daily with Jesus 
or with the Lord, right, was his life, was his sustenance and his divine ability to do everything that God him to do. When he sinned, the glory evaporated. And now he has sin consciousness. I'm trying to figure out how to go now. I'm five minutes here. Um, it's not just sin that's the problem. It's sin consciousness. I want to tell a very short story because this is very important. You know, I didn't get saved until I was 30. And this will speak to some of you guys. And then I'm going to invite some people to know Jesus because this is, this is really good news. I didn't get saved till I was 30. And I left home when I was 18. All that stuff that happened in between there is all the stuff the devil wants to accuse me of to keep me from doing what God's called me to do. And you can imagine what it was. And, uh, I mean, I'm just going to put it out there. I mean, when I moved away from home, I moved, uh, I, I just lived with women for all that period of time uh, of some form or another, right? I had a lot of girlfriends and stuff. And I didn't, I wasn't raised in a Christian home and I really wasn't, told that it was necessarily a bad thing to do. I was not in the loop on what sin was or any of that stuff. But I felt, I always felt like it wasn't good for me. And of course, those relationships would always blow up and become hurtful. And I sucked up a lot of rejection baggage and brokenheartedness and all that stuff with it. And that'll begin to affect your mind and your body and everything else. And so you don't really know that the wages of sin is death. But all you know is I'm dying, right? And, uh, then I got saved. And man, and you know, I had some momentum in that whole sinful life going, right? And I got saved. And everybody's preaching like that thing should just kind of, it's over. It just didn't go away in 24 hours. I don't know how it was with you, but I mean, I, you know, I'm putting on brakes and, 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 and this car is still moving, you know? And I was, you know, and of course, when, when people get kind of legalistic, right, they put that all on you. I didn't really know how good God was, that he was like, I'm going to walk with you in your mess, right? I'm not going to leave. I know this doesn't happen overnight. And actually, he told me, he said, you know, them grave clothes you got on, they didn't get on you overnight. It took years to wrap yourself up in all that nonsense. And he said, it's going to take a little time to unravel, so chill, you know. He said, I got you. And that was so, to know that that was God's heart was so freedom for me, right? And it, it was so powerful that he did it that it didn't matter what other people said. Because, man, I mean, you go to prophetic meetings and people scowl at you like you had demons all over your head and everything. And you didn't even want to be there, right? And one time in a meeting that happened, somebody looked at me and said a prophecy about some stuff and looked at me like you're the guy. And I brassed it out, of course, like, well, it's not me. And, but then I drove home, and I, I started to cry on the way home. I said, Lord, I'm just doing the best I can. He goes, son, that was not me. And then I realized, not everybody prophesies of God, is of God, right? Because it was very wounding. It was not edifying, exhorting, ex exhorting or comforting at all. Anyway, I'm going to say this one thing, and then I'm going to close. I finally did get free. I finally get, did get delivered. And I lived many, many, many years as a single man, not disappointing God in that area. Right? I mean, I got to a place where I had zero necessity. And I said to the Lord at a certain point in time, if, if you want me to finish my race as a single man, I, I could do it. I, I'm okay with it. Uh, I'm not driven by my sexuality to be married. But I am a little lonely. You know, for companionship and conversation and exploring the Lord and the Word together and stuff like that. You know, I mean, it, right? right? So, y'all looking at me like, <laughs> it's the glasses. It's the glasses again. So, so anyway, I get married to this beautiful girl here. I don't know how it happens. It's just the grace of God, right? So we get married and we go on our honeymoon. And I'm going to make a very powerful point here. We go on our honeymoon and then, of course, you know, we go to the Mandalay Bay and we check into our room and everything. And, and you know, it's time for our moment. <laughs> <laughs> and I am 
I'm feeling convicted. You know, I was like, eh, eh, mm. <laughs> you know. You can have an intellectual assent that you're in the will of God, but your emotional brain's mind has not been renewed yet, right? And so we had to get the word and open it up and said, okay, Jesus, it's right there. The marriage bed is honorable and undefiled. I'm in the will of God for the first time in my life in this area. And I am not going to take conviction into my marriage bed. So you need to get it out of here, right? Look, judicially, I was lawfully right to have my wife. Why was it still bothering me? We've sucked up some wrong doctrines that bring convictions that shouldn't even be there. And we need to get our mind renewed to the reality of God's righteousness and be free. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.